Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to episode 251 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about the cryptid known as the thylacine or Tasmanian tiger. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. For thousands of years, humans and creatures known as thylacines or Tasmanian tigers lived alongside each other in Australia and neighboring lands, but their population was gradually getting smaller. In 1936, The last known thylacine tragically died in a zoo, but reports of thylacines in the wild continued. In fact, there have been thousands of such reports, and although it's officially extinct, many think the thylacine is still secretly living in the wild. Consequently, it's been called the healthiest extinct animal you'll ever see, and others are planning to use modern DNA technology to bring them back. What do we know about thylacines? Do they still exist, and when will we have them? That's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. Uh, Today's episode deals with an Australian mystery, so it's going to be a crossover episode. What would you like to say about that, Jimmy? Well, we've done Australian mysteries before, like episode 73 on Somerton Man, whose identity is now finally known, and as I predicted, it turned out that DNA testing would eventually reveal his identity. It now appears that he was an electrical engineer named Carl Charles Webb. His name was Carl, but he went by Charles. And we'll have a link to where you can read about him. We also did an Australian mystery in episode 148 on the fearsome cryptids known as drop bears. And for that, we had my friend Matt Frad and our friends from the Catholics of Oz do the voice work for the episode. So since we're doing another Australian cryptid this time, I thought it would only be appropriate to invite them back and have them do the voice work for this episode, too. So I want to say a special thanks to Matt Frad of Pints with Aquinas and Lindsay, Carolyn and Lino from the Catholics of Oz. Uh, Be sure to check out both Pints with Aquinas on YouTube and the Catholics of Oz wherever podcasts are found. Also, Lindsay, Carolyn, and Lino have another podcast called Let's Science, which is devoted to scientific matters like the one we're examining today. So that's especially appropriate, and you'll want to check out that podcast, too. Jimmy, in the opening, we said that the cryptids we're talking about today are known both as thylacines and as Tasmanian tigers. Why the difference in names? Well, creatures go by different names, including familiar ones like cats and felines or dogs and hounds. Uh, Thylacines are no different, and they go by several names. Popularly, they're often called Tasmanian tigers because they were native to the island of Tasmania and because they had tiger-like stripes on their hindquarters. They're also called uh, Tasmanian wolves, again, because they lived in Tasmania and because they looked a lot like dogs and functioned in their environment a lot like wolves. Their scientific name is Thylacinus cynocephalus. Uh, Thylacines are marsupial mammals, so they have pouches, and the Greek word for pouch or sac is thulakos. And they stuck on the Latin ending enus on the end of that. Enus is a marker of possession in this case. So thylacinus or thylacinus, to say it another Latin way, means animal having a pouch. The second part of their name, cynocephalus, comes from purely Greek roots. In Greek, kuon means dog and kephalos means head. So a thylacinus cynocephalus is a pouch-bearing animal with a dog's head. The English name thylacine is then just a shortened adaptation of their scientific name, and they also have various other names in the local Aboriginal languages. We're referring to thylacines as cryptids. For those who may not be familiar with the term, what are cryptids? A uh, cryptid is a hidden animal. Uh, the word comes from the Greek root kryptos, which means hidden. More specifically, a cryptid is an animal that is believed by some people to exist, even though its existence is not confirmed in modern mainstream science. 
The most famous cryptids are things like Bigfoot, which we talked about way back in Episode 3, and who we'll talk more about in the future, and also the Loch Ness Monster, who we talked about in Episodes 236 and again in Episode 237. But another category of cryptids are those that are animals that are known to have existed in the past, but are thought to be extinct. Uh, for example, we know that Tyrannosaurus rexes used to exist, but today they're regarded as extinct. If it turned out that they were secretly alive in a hidden valley somewhere, like Arthur Conan Doyle might write about, then they would be cryptids. And that's essentially the claim for thylacines. We know they used to exist. They're believed in mainstream science today to be extinct. But some people believe they're really still out there, alive in the wild, making them hidden creatures or cryptids. If thylacines are called Tasmanian tigers or Tasmanian wolves, were they only found in Tasmania? No, they had a rather broad range. Uh, Tasmania is an island off the south coast of Australia, and today it's one of the Australian states. But thylacines also ranged all across the mainland of Australia, and they are also known to have lived on the nearby northern island of New Guinea, which today is part of the nation of Indonesia. When were thylacines first discovered? Well, that would have been uh, tens of thousands of years ago when people first started moving into what's now Indonesia and Australia. For example, the Australian Aborigines are thought to have arrived at least 65,000 years ago. And we know that they were aware of thylacines because they left rock art. And in the rock art, you can clearly see that the hindquarters of the animal has stripes on it, whereas the forequarters do not. So the aboriginal peoples knew about thylacines for tens of thousands of years. When it comes to their discovery by Europeans, that's much more recent, of course. And we're not really sure exactly when it happened. It may have happened as early as 1642. In that year, Abel Tasman, the explorer that Tasmania is named after, landed on the island, and he said that he found tracks of an animal that had claws like a tiger, which could be a reference to thylacine tracks, but that's not certain. Then, in 1772, the explorer and pirate Marion Dufresne saw an animal that he described as a tiger cat. Uh, but that's not considered certain as a reference to a thylacine because there's another local animal known as a tiger qual, and it's thought that he might have seen a tiger qual. However, to me, tiger quals don't look anything like a tiger, so I don't know why they're called that. Uh, they have spots rather than stripes, and I'd be much more likely to describe a thylacine as a tiger cat since they have stripes. However, we know that thylacines had been discovered by 1792, when they were recorded by the naturalist Jacques Billardier. So Europeans definitely knew about them by the end of the 1700s. One of the things we're fortunate about is that, unlike other cryptids, we've actually been able to study thylacines. They're not like Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. We know they existed, and scientists have had a chance to study them, so we understand what they're like a lot better. Let's talk about what thylacines are like physically. I'll ask you a series of questions about them. And First, what kind of animal are they? Well, they're marsupials, like kangaroos and possums, so they have a pouch that they carry their young in. They probably developed around two million years ago. They're an example of what's called convergent evolution, which is what happens when two species develop in similar ecological niches. Uh, when that happens, they tend to resemble each other because they're playing the same function in the environment. Even though they're not related, they'll look the same. In this case, thylacines occupied an ecological niche similar to that of wolves, foxes, or dogs, so they came to resemble the canids that live in other parts of the world. They have a body form that is similar to wolves, foxes, and dogs. They're about the same size. They're predators with really sharp teeth, and they walk on the pads of their feet with elevated heels on the front and back legs, just like dogs and wolves. 
they even scratch themselves, like dogs using one of their hind legs. However, unlike many dogs, thylacines had round ears that stood up on their heads. They didn't have the floppy ears that dogs often do. Those floppy ears are a product of domestication, and thylacines were never domesticated. How big do thylacines get in terms of size? In terms of how tall they get, they reach up to about 24 inches or 2 feet at the shoulder. But like dogs, they're longer than that. Their body lengths are between 40 and 50 inches, uh, a bit more than 3 or 4 feet long. In addition to their body length, they also have a really long tail. Their tails are between 20 and 26 inches long. So in addition to bodies of three or four feet, they have tails about two feet long, which means their tails are really, really long proportionally, much longer than the tails of dogs or wolves. Their tails also are unusually stiff. Uh, This is because some of the bones in their tails are fused together. So one sign that you're looking at a thylacine is that it has a really long, stiff tail. How much do they weigh? Adult thylacines are typically between 25 and 50 pounds, though they can be lighter or heavier than that. Put in dog terms, thylacines are about the size of cocker spaniels, and the larger ones are the size of Siberian huskies. Their range of sizes, I should say the smaller ones are like cocker spaniels, their range of sizes are about the same as border collies, which are typically 30 to 55 pounds. There's also a difference uh, in size in weight between the two sexes. Male thylacines tend to be bigger and heavier than female thylacines, which is not true of many dog breeds, but it is true of thylacines. And since they're marsupials, the females have pouches for the young. Yeah, uh, thylacine litters typically have uh, tend to have one to four joeys, as the offspring are known. Typically, they'll, they would give birth to two or three joeys. But there's something unusual about their pouches. Most marsupials have pouches that face forward, like if you see a kangaroo down on all fours, its pouch opens towards its head, towards the front of the body. But thylacine pouches face backwards towards their tails. Also, both sexes have them, so males have pouches too. And since males don't have babies to keep in their pouches, they actually keep their, um, their man parts in their pouches to protect them while they're running along hunting. So that's kind of weird. Uh, when it comes to breeding, it appears thylacines bred the whole year round, just like humans do. Uh, but they did have their peak breeding season in the winter and the spring. They also did not breed well in captivity. There's only one known case where a pair of thylacines were successfully bred in captivity. So they're kind of like pandas in that respect, which makes it harder to keep them from going extinct. For female thylacines in zoos, I guess it was largely, not tonight, honey, I'm in jail. (laughs) So what color are thylacines? Their coats, which are made of soft, short, fur are generally described as being brown in color, though it varies. Some are very light brown, while others can be dark brown. The fur also apparently grew longer in the colder winter months, which in Australia would mean like July through August. Uh, The photos that we have from when thylacines were alive, unfortunately, are in black and white. But we still have stuffed thylacines in museums, so we can see their color directly. We also have color illustrations from before they were extinct, and based on these colors, it's been possible to colorize old footage of thylacines in captivity. So you can even see motion footage of them in full color, which is really cool. There also are reports of thylacines that looked gray in color. Uh, In addition to their overall coat of brown fur, Thylacines also had 15 to 20 darker stripes on their hindquarters. These stripes apparently were not black, but just a darker brown than the rest of the body, although at least at a distance they could appear black or gray. And they tended to grow lighter 
as the thylacine got older, so they faded with time. There are even reports of thylacines without stripes, and it's possible that these were older specimens whose stripes had faded so much that they were not visible anymore, at least at a distance. Why would thylacines have stripes? As uh, with other species, it's thought that the stripes were used as camouflage so that it helps them hide in the undergrowth. But that's not for protection because thylacines were apex predators. They weren't, there weren't any animals that had evolved to prey on thylacines. Instead, the camouflage stripes would have helped them be better hunters by allowing them to go unseen and then ambush their prey. And thylacines needed to hunt. From what I've been able to determine, they were exclusively carnivorous or obligate carnivores like cats are. So if they didn't hunt, they didn't survive. It's also speculated that the stripes may have helped the thylacines identify each other by recognizing their stripe patterns. There are different hunting strategies that animals use. So if thylacines were predators, how did they hunt? Well, it turns out that the thylacine jaw is rather unusual. In the first place, they could open it at an 80-degree angle, so almost a full 90-degree right angle. And we have, them pictures, we have pictures of them doing that in captivity. Apparently, they would sometimes warn people away by opening their mouths really wide in a kind of threat yawn in which they showed their teeth. And being able to open their mouths really wide would mean they could take really big bites of food. Their stomachs also were expandable, which meant that they could gorge themselves in a single feeding so that they wouldn't have to eat again for a longer period of time. But despite these features, at least according to some accounts, their jaws were rather weak. Uh, according to these accounts, they couldn't bite down as hard, for example, as wolves would. However, there's a dispute about that. In his book, The Search for Real Monsters, Adventures in Cryptozoology, Volume 2, Richard Freeman describes a conversation he had with a naturalist and thylacine hunter named Colin Bailey. We spoke for some time and discussed the power of the animal's bites. A recent paper tried to claim that the animal had weak jaws and would only feed on small creatures like possums. This is totally at odds with contemporary field reports, which said the Tasmanian wolf kills and ate kangaroos, wallabies, and full-grown sheep, killing them with exceptionally powerful bites. Several reports said that, when cornered by dogs, a thylacine could bite clean through a, a dog's skull. A more recent paper refuted the weak jaw hypothesis. Looking at the skull anatomy, its authors concluded that the thylacine had a much more powerful bite than a wolf or dog, but the skull was not as well adapted to hold on to struggling prey. Wolves being pack hunters surrounded their quarry and hang onto it, worrying it to death. The solitary thylacine kills with one or more powerful bites. So there's a dispute about just how powerful thylacine's bites were. Nevertheless, the evidence suggests that they often hunted as pursuit predators. That is, they would chase their prey until it was too tired to run anymore. Uh, that's something that they have in common with humans. Humans are not very fast compared to other animals because we don't have many fast twitch muscle fibers which you need to run fast. But humans have lots of slow twitch muscle fibers, which means we can just keep going when other animals have to quit. So our ancestors would often wear out their prey by outlasting them. I mean, sure, a deer can outrun us. They're way faster than us, but they can't keep it up for very long. So human hunter-gatherers could just keep following the deer until it was too tired, and then you've got meat for the tribe. Well, thylacines apparently used a similar strategy. They apparently outlasted their prey and went for distance rather than speed. That's consistent with the way they were often described as moving. They apparently couldn't run very fast. They are described by eyewitnesses as having a stiff, awkward gait. And when they needed to move faster, they had a kind of hopping gait, rather like a kangaroo, instead of a running gait like a wolf or a dog. All that's consistent with an animal that couldn't keep up with the faster animals, but that could outlast them over time. 
However, they also were seen working as ambush predators that would surprise their prey. What kind of animals did they eat? Undoubtedly, whatever was available, but it appears that they especially liked birds, like emus, which are large flightless birds whose survival strategy is running away from things. Uh, apparently, thylacines would chase emus and other birds until they could take them down. The fact that they liked eating birds is consistent with the relatively weak bite force theory, because the bones of birds aren't very strong and heavy, since they, or at least their ancestors, were bred for flight. So it would be easier for thylacines to eat them. And we know that they sometimes preyed on chickens, which did not endear them to farmers who kept chickens as livestock. Did they hunt as individuals or in groups? Apparently in groups, uh, thylacines were frequently seen traveling as families, and sometimes they were seen traveling in e even larger groups. This is similar to the way that many canid species like wolves work, hunting in packs that are made up of one or more families. But it's different than what other canids do, like red foxes, which are solitary hunters. Humans are diurnal creatures, meaning that they're most active in the daytime. But other species are nocturnal and are active at night. So what were thylacines? They uh, were apparently primarily nocturnal, like cats are. Uh, during the daytime, thylacines slunk away and slept in nests, in caves, or tree trunks. But they were also crepuscular, which means they were active during the dawn and the dusk, like deer are. So while they were holed up during the bright part of the day, they were active at dawn, dusk, and at night. And so those are the periods when they did their hunting. Did thylacines have any unusual signature, like sounds or smells? Some witnesses described thylacines as having an unusual smell. So that's part of the historical record. But other sources didn't indicate this, so it's ambiguous whether they had a strong, notable odor. When it comes to sounds, thylacines are described as making a number of them. Uh, for example, some thylacines are described as using growls or hisses to warn people away. They're also described as using a kind of cough-like bark as a signal to other thylacines. This noise is described in human terms as sounding like yip-yap, kayip, and hop-hop-hop. So you can make of that what you will. How long did thylacines live? Apparently their lifespans in the wild were five to seven years, but animals tend to live longer when they're under man's protection, and in captivity they could live up to nine years, so a little shorter than most dog breeds. Do we have any sense of what thylacine personalities were like? Could they be cuddly, like dogs? From what I've been able to determine, it's hard to say. Uh, to really know whether an animal can be cuddly to humans, you, you really need to raise it from birth. But thylacines were only successfully bred once in captivity, and other thylacines were raised in the wild and may not have been cuddly once they were captured. Uh, for what I can say is that thylacines were observed to have uh, shy and secretive personalities, though sometimes they would seem inquisitive about humans and would come close in order to study us. Whether they had true cuddle potential is something I'm afraid we'll have to wait to find out. Now that we've described the animal itself, let's talk about its extinction. What can you tell us? The first thing is that it went extinct in stages. It didn't happen all at once. And despite the fact that Australia was the central part of its territory between Tasmania in the south and New Guinea in the north, Australia is where they went extinct first. They then survived in the northernmost and southernmost parts of their range, despite the fact that humans arrived in Australia more than 65,000 years ago Thylacine survived in Australia almost up until European contact. It appears that they were almost extinct by about 2,000 years ago, and it appears that they went extinct in New Guinea around the same time. At least those are the mainstream scientific accounts. The reasons for those extinctions are debated. One proposal 
is that the human population of Australia started increasing about 4,000 years ago, and the increase in the aboriginal population may have put additional pressure on the thylacines. Not necessarily directly, not because aborigines were hunting thylacines, but perhaps because there were more people, they were hunting something that the thylacines ate, and so the thylacines couldn't get enough food. Another proposed cause is the appearance of dingoes. Dingoes are a kind of dog, and they apparently started appearing in Australia around 8,000 years ago. Also, as a kind of dog, they hunted alongside humans. So when the human population began to go up around 4,000 years ago, the dingo population would have gone up too. And dingoes, occupying the same kind of ecological niche that thylacines do, would eat the same kind of prey animals that thylacines did. So the thylacines might not have gotten enough food because of competition with dingoes. One way or another, the thylacines were regarded as having gone extinct in Australia about 2,000 years ago, so before European contact. But this is disputed. There also are reports from Aborigines and Europeans of thylacine sightings in Australia down to the 1830s. If thylacines went extinct in Australia and New Guinea, what about the third area where they lived, Tasmania? How'd they go extinct there? Thylacines survived there well into the period of European contact, and European uh, colonization contributed to their extinction. When Europeans arrived in Tasmania, they started farming. So they cleared land, and that meant getting rid of some of the habitat that thylacines occupied. Worse yet, the farmers started suspecting that the thylacines were killing their sheep. But it's questionable how much that was really happening, because remember, according to some accounts, thylacines had a fairly weak bite. But people believed they were killing the sheep, and people therefore were encouraged to kill thylacines in order to end the livestock predation. The Van Diemen's Land Company started paying bounties for dead thylacines in 1830. They'd give you a British pound for a dead adult thylacine, which would be worth 135 pounds or 165 U.S. dollars today, after all the inflation that the governments have caused. And they'd give you 11 shillings for a dead thylacine joey. Thylacines also were facing competition from the dogs that Europeans brought with them, and a disease was starting to spread among them. The disease resembled distemper, which is a canine disease that attacks the nervous system and resembles rabies, except it's worse than rabies because it can be spread through the air by animals coughing and sneezing, not just through being bitten like rabies spreads. So between the farmers and the bounty hunters, the dogs and the new disease, the thylacines were under a lot of pressure. Did anyone try to save them? Yes, a thylacine conservation movement began in 1901. And in 1928, a proposal was made to set up a wildlife preserve to keep them alive as a species. But it was too late. In 1930, the last known thylacine to be killed in the wild was shot by a farmer named Wilf Batty. And after that, thylacine survived only in captivity in the primitive zoos that they had at the time. When did the last thylacine die? With a possible exception of something I'll mention in a moment, the last captive thylacine was a male that today is referred to as Benjamin, though we don't have proof that he was called Benjamin when he was alive. Benjamin was captured in the wild and then lived in the Hobart Zoo in Hobart, Tasmania, which is also known as Bomeris Zoo. There had been other thylacines in captivity, but Benjamin outlasted them, and as such, He was regarded, or is regarded, as an endling. An endling is called that because it's the last of its kind, because it's the end of its line. Kind of like Superman used to be the Kryptonian endling before Supergirl showed up. Endlings are also sometimes known as Terminarchs, which is a really cool name because based on its roots, 
Terminarch would mean something like the ruler of the end. Uh, it mixes Greek and Latin roots, which is something of a no-no in etymology, but it still sounds cool. In any event, we also have footage of Benjamin in the zoo. And uh, some of this footage was taken in 1933 by a naturalist named David Fly. And apparently, Benjamin bit Fly on the butt while he was taking the footage. So a little bit of thylacine revenge. Good for you, Benjamin. So uh, when did Benjamin die? In 1936, and it happened in a particularly tragic and stupid way. Um, September 6th, 1936, was a day of extreme temperatures in Tasmania, with it getting super hot during the day and then plunging down to freezing at night. Well, the zookeepers forgot to put Benjamin into his sleeping shelter during the night, so he was locked out in below zero temperatures and froze to death which is just tragic and stupid. Yes. Did the zoo authorities realize that the last thylacine had died? No, because they didn't realize that Benjamin was an endling. Uh, so they expected they'd get a new thylacine. And they didn't even bother mentioning his death in the press. But no new thylacine was ever captured. You said that Benjamin was the last captive thylacine with one possible exception. What was the exception you were thinking of? In the middle of doing my research for this episode, it was suddenly announced that a new last captive thylacine may have been discovered. The discovery of the creature's remains was announced at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, popularly known as TMAG. According to them, Benjamin was not the actual last captive thylacine. There was another. Here's part of what TMAG announced. Dr. Robert Paddle said the actual last thylacine, or ending of the species, was an old female animal that had been captured by Trapper Elias Churchill from the Florentine Valley and sold to the zoo in the middle of May 1936. The sale was not recorded or publicised by the zoo. At the time, ground-based snaring was illegal and Churchill could have been fined, Dr. Paddle said. The thylacine only lived for a few months, and when it died, its body was transferred to TMAG. For years, many museum curators and researchers searched for its remains without success, as no thylacine material dating from 1936 had been recorded in the zoological collection, and so it was assumed its body had been discarded. The thylacine body had been skinned and the disarticulated skeleton was positioned on a series of five cards to be included in the newly formed education collection overseen by museum science teacher Mr A. W. G. Powell, Mrs Catherine Medlock said. The arrangement of the skeleton on the cards allowed museum teachers to explain thylacine anatomy to students. TMAG director Mary Melkahi said that the last thylacine's tanned, flat skin and disarticulated skeleton, still attached to the five cards created for the education collection, were now on display in the museum's thylacine gallery. It is bittersweet that the mystery surrounding the remains of the last thylacine has been solved and that it has been discovered to be part of TMAG's collection, Ms. Melkahi said. Our thylacine collection at TMAG is very precious and is held in high regard by researchers, with the museum regularly receiving requests to access our mounted specimens, as well as thylacine bones, skins and preserved pouch young. Our thylacine gallery is incredibly popular with visitors and we invite everyone to TMAG to see the remains of the last thylacine, finally on show for all to see. So they found the remains of a thylacine in the museum that they now believe to have been the last captive one. They say it was a female they received in mid-May 1936, and it lived only a few months. They don't say when, it's, when it died, but if they're correct that it was the last captive one, then it had to have lived until sometime after September 6, 1936, because that's when Benjamin was left out in the cold and died. I haven't been able to verify when this female died, but it's possible that it was actually the last captive thylacine rather than Benjamin. If they didn't realize Benjamin, 
or the other female one was the last one. When were thylacines declared extinct? Just because the last captive animal dies doesn't mean that there aren't still others out in the wild. So under the, con under the conventions that were being used at the time, you needed to wait an extra 50 years after the last confirmed sighting in the wild before you declared a species extinct. Benjamin died in 1936, and so 50 years later, in 1986, the Tasmanian government declared thylacines extinct. And that brings us up to the point where the controversy over thylacines really still exists begins. Then, till we get to that, let's take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Nathan C., Hugh P., Rob P., Julie L., and Blair N. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Tim Shevlin's Personal Fitness Training for Catholics, providing spiritual and physical wellness through personalized nutrition, workout and prayer programs, and daily accountability check-ins. Learn more by visiting fitcatholics.com. Jimmy, what theories are there about thylacines? From the reason perspective, there are two basic theories that we need to consider. First, are thylacines really extinct? Or second, do they continue to exist in the wild? We also need to consider whether it's really possible to bring them back or de-extinct them. Also, from the faith perspective, we need to consider the morals of extinction and de-extinction. Is it okay to let animals go extinct? Is it okay to bring them back? And do we have an obligation to bring them back? So what can we say about thylacines from the reason perspective? The mainstream view is that they are now extinct, but are there species that were thought to be extinct and later rediscovered? Absolutely. Uh, here are a few examples from Richard Freeman in his book, The Search for Real Monsters, Adventures in Cryptozoology, Volume 2. Time and again, animals that we have thought to be extinct have turned up alive and well. The night parrot, Pisoporus occidentalis, is a small parrot from Central Australia which was thought to be extinct. No sighting had occurred since 1912. Then, in 2013, it turned up out of the blue in a remote, arid area of the outback. The night parrot is a small creature, a bit like a budgie on steroids. Not like the Zanzibar leopard, Panthera pardus pardus, which was thought extinct after a campaign to exterminate it in the 1960s. In 2018, one strolled into view and was filmed by a camera trap. Zanzibar has an area of 950 square miles, a tiny space in which to hide a population of leopards, but they are there. The Takirihi, Porphyrio hoxtateri, is a large flightless bird related to the moorhen and found only on New Zealand. It was last seen in 1898, but was rediscovered in 1948 in the mountains of South Island. The Bermuda petrel, Pterodrama cahau, is a seabird identified in 1612. It was thought to have been hunted to extinction by the 1620s and was thought extinct for over 300 years until one crashed into a lighthouse in 1951. We now know this extinct bird nests on four islands off Bermuda. So there are definitely animals that have been thought to be extinct and then been rediscovered. I read a science news headline aggregator every day and Every few months, I see a news story like that. Why do some people think that thylacines are still alive, that they didn't go extinct back in 1936? Because people continue to report seeing them, and a lot of people. In fact, since 1936, there have been over 4,000 reports of living thylacines. And the fact they keep reporting thylacines in particular is significant. Richard Freeman states, There are many iconic extinct animals, such as the dodo, Raphus cucullatus, the great auk, P. 
Pinguinus impennis, and the passenger pigeon, Ectopistes migratorius, that nobody reports seeing. But people report the Tasmanian wolf, or thylacine, on a regular basis. And I think that is significant. The dodo and the passenger pigeon are even more famous as extinct animals than the thylacine. I mean, certainly here in the Northern Hemisphere in North America, people have heard of dodos and passenger pigeons, but most people have not heard of thylacines. A lot more people know about them, and that means that there are more people who might want to see them and who then imagine seeing them. Also, if people wanted to report sightings just for attention, you'd get a lot more attention reporting a dodo or a passenger pigeon, since more people have heard of those. And yet, nobody reports sighting those extinct animals. So, the fact that large numbers of people do report seeing the less famous thylacines is significant. Now, because there have been over 4,000 reported thylacine sightings, we won't be covering all of them. We won't even be covering a fraction of them. But we will cover what I consider some of the best reports, ones that were made by especially credible witnesses like zoologists and park rangers. Uh, If you'd like to read about more sightings, I suggest you check out Richard Freeman's book, which we'll have a link to. Thylacines were known to have lived in three locations, Tasmania, Australia, and New Guinea. Let's talk about each of those and see what kind of reports have been made. Are there credible ones from Tasmania? Yes, of the 4,000 thylacine sightings, around 1,200 of them have been from Tasmania, and there was a particularly credible one made there in 1982. The witness was a zoologist named Hans Narding. Uh, He was in Tasmania to study a particular bird. He was out in the woods, asleep in his vehicle, and at 2 a.m. he woke up. This is what he reports. I was in the habit of intermittently shining a spotlight around. The beam fell on an animal in front of the vehicle less than 10 meters away. Instead of risking movement by grabbing for a camera, I decided to register very carefully what I was seeing. The animal was about the size of a small shepherd dog, a very healthy male in prime condition. What set it apart from a dog, though, was a slightly sloping hindquarter, with a fairly thick tail being a straight continuation of the back line of the animal. It had 12 distinct stripes on its back, continuing onto its butt. I knew perfectly well what I was seeing. As soon as I reached for the camera, it disappeared into the tea tree undergrowth and scrub. Narding was a very credible witness as a zoologist. He observed the animal very carefully in the light of his beam, and he observed it for three minutes. Afterwards, the government did an investigation on this sighting, and the report concluded that... It must be accepted that thylacine survive in a number of areas of Tasmania. That was in 1982. However, Governments are made up of many people with many different opinions, and the report didn't stop the Tasmanian government from declaring thylacines extinct four years later in 1986. Another quite credible sighting in Tasmania took place in the 1990s. In January 1995, a man named Charles Beasley saw one. He was a ranger with the Department of Environment and Land Management, and he saw the animal through binoculars for two minutes. He describes the animal this way. Dirty brown color with black stripes down its rib cage and about half the size of a full-grown Alsatian dog. It had a face like a Staffordshire Bull Terrier, but more elongated. The animal stretched, turned, and walked back into the dense scrub. The tail was heavy and somewhat like that of a kangaroo and was held out in a gentle curve. And since Beasley was a wildlife ranger, he was another competent witness that would be expected to be both a good observer and an expert in identifying local animals who would know that this was not any local animal, but rather a thylacine. Let's move north from Tasmania, jumping over Australia, and look at New Guinea. Are there any indications that the thylacine might be alive there? There is evidence that thylacines may still exist in the West Papua province of Indonesia. In his book, In Search of Real Monsters, Richard Freeman writes, In West Papua, formerly Irian Jaya, 
the hill tribes report a dog-like carnivore they call Dobsonga. They describe it as looking like a dog with striped flanks, a stiff tail and wide jaws. They say it comes down from the mountains and kills pigs, goats and other livestock. Thylacine hunter Ned Terry visited the area and showed the natives pictures of the Tasmanian wolf, which they identified as Dobsonga. So according to the natives, thylacines continued to exist in West Papua, where they were known as Dobsongas. Uh, one sighting that was reported in New Guinea even involved people getting close enough to touch thylacines. Freeman writes, In the early 1970s, Jan Sarkeng, working with a friend, Punkajaya, had just made camp for some geologists and were eating a meal. Two dog-like animals, an adult and a pup, emerged from the bush, apparently attracted by the smell of food. They were pale-coloured, with wide mouths and stiff tails. The pup came close enough for one man to feed it. Then he tried to grab it, but the pup bit his hand and both animals ran back into the bush. Ouch. Uh, Be careful with your hands if you're going to try to feed a thylacine. In any event, yes, there are reports of thylacines still existing in New Guinea. And what about on mainland Australia? Do we have reports of them there? We do. Um, Here is another one that involves a particularly credible witness who was a park ranger. Richard Freeman reports. In 1982, National Park's ranger Peter Simon saw a thylacine in a clearing near Gibraltar Creek, Australian Capital Territory. Having seen many illustrations of the Tasmanian wolf, or thylacine, he was adamant that this was what he had seen. He was only 100 feet from the animal as it crossed the clearing. During the following year, two groups of tourists told him that they had seen the same animal in the area. So yes, even though thylacines are thought to have been extinct on mainland Australia for perhaps 2,000 years, there are at least reports of them being there also. And it's worth noting that the population density in Australia is extremely low. Uh, New Guinea, Tasmania, and Australia all have really low population densities. And the density in Australia is the lowest of the three, with only 1.3 human beings per square mile. So there's lots of empty space where thylacines could be living, especially since they're known to be shy and secretive and to avoid humans. The sightings that we've mentioned fall after 1936, when thylacines allegedly went extinct, but that was almost 90 years ago. It's not unlikely that a few thylacines were living in the wild after 1936, but they could have gone extinct in the 90 years since then. The sightings we've mentioned occurred between the 1970s and the 1990s. One was in 1995, but that was almost 30 years ago. Have there been any more recent sightings? In 2013, Richard Freeman went on an expedition to look for thylacines, and during the expedition, he received reports of much more recent encounters uh, that are only around 10 years old at this point in 2023 when we're recording this. For example, he reported visiting a location in Mole Creek in central Tasmania. We had been booked into the Mole Creek Hotel, home of the famous Tasmanian Tiger Bar. The hotel itself has a sort of old-fashioned charm with a 1950s feel to it. I felt very comfortable there, and it had a very lovely atmosphere. The Tasmanian Tiger Bar is like a small museum filled with thylacine memorabilia. There are paintings, sculptures, and a wall full of framed newspaper reports of sightings. They even serve Tasmanian Tiger Ale, a very tasty pale ale that I imbibed several pints of. And since this is Australia, of course they have a beer named after thylacines, and since Freeman is British, of course he consumed several pints. The thing that's significant for our purposes is a conversation that he had with the landlord of the bar, a man named Doug Westbrook. Doug said that in 2011, a French girl staying at the hotel had a very similar sighting, about two kilometres from Moore Creek. She saw a thylacine crossing the road in front of the car she was driving. As with Ramona, she saw the striped rump, stiff tail, and strange gait. She too had used the phrase, like a dog with a broken back, to describe how the animal had moved. So there were still thylacine reports coming in quite recently. 
Incidentally, uh, Freeman describes some of his own efforts in the thylacine hunting expedition. Around this particular lake, people have claimed to have heard the distinctive call of the thylacine at night. It is said to be a high-pitched yap in three parts, yip, yip, yip. It's said to be quite distinct from all other native animals, and quite unlike a fox's. We set up some camera traps, sensitive to both heat and motion. These were baited with leftover chicken, cat food, and bacon jerky. We set up other cameras along a long, closed, and barricaded road, reasoning that this would be doubly undisturbed. We searched for roadkill to use as further bait, but found none. Unfortunately, Freeman didn't get any pictures of thylacines on his own expedition, but he did get a report of another recent sighting that would have taken place around the end of 2011 or the beginning of 2012. It was reported to Richard Freeman on his expedition by a local man named Bill Morgan. Bill had recently caught up with his cousin, whom he had not seen in decades. Amazingly, just 18 months earlier, the cousin and five other people in a car had seen a family group of thylacines, a male, a female, and three pups crossed the road in front of them. And that's a positive sign that thylacines could still be out there and still breeding in the wild. If thylacines are still out there breeding, then they have to have a breeding population. Can't just be a single thylacine living all these years, not if they only live to be around nine years old. So what kind of breeding population would they need? This is something that Freeman covers in his book. He writes, Dr. David Pemberton, curator of zoology at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, whose PhD thesis was on the thylacine, says that despite the scientific belief that 500 animals are required to sustain a population, the Florida panther is down to a dozen or so animals, and while it does have some inbreeding problems, is still ticking along. He said, I take a punt and say that if we manage to find a thylacine in the scrub, it means that there are 50 plus animals out there. So it's a common opinion that you would need a breeding population of 500 animals, but you can make do with fewer than that, especially if you're willing to tolerate some genetic diversity problems. And Dr. Pemberton estimates that as few as 50 animals could be in the thylacine population and that, that it would still survive. Given how big Tasmania and New Guinea are, and certainly given how big mainland Australia is, there could easily be 50 to 500 animals in any one of these locations. There's also been a computer study done on the thylacine population issue. What can you tell us about that? The study was done by Professor Henry Nix. It looked at where thylacines might be living in Tasmania, and it looked at two key factors. First, it looked at where thylacines would be likely to still be living based on their known habitat and preferences. And second, it looked at where thylacine sightings have actually been reported. Richard Freeman writes, The creature's continued survival has even been predicted by a computer program. Professor Henry Nix of the Australian University's Centre for Resource and Environmental Studies developed a program called BioClime, a research tool BioClime matched what was known about the habits and preferences of a species with geographical areas. It matched the two up and predicted where, within a given area, the target species was most likely to be found. Nix applied this to the thylacine. There was an almost perfect match between where the program predicted the animals would be if they had survived and the areas where sightings were being made. Nix concluded that people really were seeing thylacines. Professor Nix thought that as many as a thousand thylacines may still exist island-wide. So, at least according to this computer model, where we'd predict the thylacines to be living is exactly where people are reporting to see them. And Professor Nix concluded that they are indeed still alive and that as many as a thousand of them are in Tasmania. Sighting reports and computer simulations are good, but do we have any concrete evidence that thylacines are still alive? Well, animals do leave traces in their environments, and people have found some tracks that appear to be footprints of thylacines. Uh, These have to be carefully distinguished from the tracks of other animals, but thylacine footprints do have distinctive characteristics that are unique to them and not shared by other animals. 
Sometimes people take photographs of these prints, but other times they take plaster casts of them. So we have little bitty thylacine footprint casts, just like we have great big Bigfoot footprint plaster casts. Are the people who collect this evidence credible? Thylacine hunters collect a variety of types of evidence, not just footprints, and different groups of thylacine hunters have different levels of credibility. One that I'm favorably impressed with is the thylacine research unit. The analyses I've seen from them seem to be pretty balanced. Uh, for example, they do videos interviewing psychologists about the psychology of thylacine sightings and how people can be led to misperceive things. Here's one of their researchers, wildlife artist Bill Flowers. In the video, he's describing how he went to a museum vault and then using his skills as a wildlife artist, managed to make careful sketches of thylacine paws. The TIU team was lucky enough to get down into the vaults, and while I was there, the curator held up some specimens of thylacine paws for me to sketch. Here's the sketch that I did of that thylacine paw. So what I drew from was a preserved specimen of a foot. Now it's quite possible that there could be shrinking or swelling, uh, but when I have a look at this other drawing from an artist, Pocock, back in 1926, it's fairly similar. You can sort of see the three sections of the metacarpal pad. Uh, it's got a bit more fur. Uh, with uh, Cockpo, he's actually stretched out uh, the front paw. So this is something that a scientist would do who's doing a study would be stretching things out just to see how far it would splay out. And when I look at that, I kind of think Tassie Devil because they tend to do that more so than all the specimens I've seen of thylacine. You'll notice that just in this clip, he warns about not confusing thylacine paws with those of Tasmanian devils based on sketches you may see. And he goes on to talk about other factors that can lead to the misidentification of thylacine prints. So there are thylacine hunters who are very careful and who have a good skeptical attitude towards their subject. On the other hand, just as with Bigfoot hunters, there are some who are credulous yahoos who want to see everything as proof that thylacines still exist. Bigfoot hunters go out into the woods and take audio recordings of things they believe may be Bigfoot noises. Do thylacine hunters do the same thing? Yes, and here's a clip from one of them, and I've enhanced the audio so that you can hear the animal. Uh, this recording was taken from inside of a tent, and there's a human that you can hear breathing in the sonic foreground. Uh, I've also selected parts where the Australians in the tent aren't using any cuss words because, you know, Australia. Um, but you can definitely hear, if you listen closely, a creature yipping in the distance. So if you listen carefully, as I said, there is definitely an animal yipping out in the woods, and thylacines are reported to have made yipping noises. But the problem, apart from the low recording, the low quality of the recording, is that we don't seem to have any sound recordings from before thylacines were extinct, at least not that I've been able to find. So we can't compare the audio of a file like this to the audio of a known thylacine recording. We can only compare it to written descriptions of what they sounded like, so that isn't proof. What about photos? We got lots of fuzzy Bigfoot photos. And we've got fuzzy thylacine photos, too. In 2021, the Thylacine Awareness Group announced that they had gotten several photos of a family. This is a different group, by the way. But they announced that they would got several photos of thylacines on camera traps in Tasmania. This caused a lot of buzz, and they sent the photos off to be analyzed by thylacine expert Nick Mooney at the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, or TMAC. Uh, but when Mooney analyzed the images, he concluded that they were actually potamelons. 
which are another marsupial that's kind of like a smaller kangaroo or wallaby. So a debate started, and thus far, we haven't gotten good, clear, irrefutable proof of a living thylacine. What about videos? They would capture things about thylacines that a still photo wouldn't, like how the animal moves. People have taken videos that they claim or suspect may show thylacines. However, most of these cases turn out to be mistaken identification. Richard Freeman states, A number of films and photographs have turned up purporting to show thylacines on the mainland. Most of these appear to be feral red foxes, vulpes vulpes, with mange. Mange is a skin disease caused by parasitic mites, and the mites cause patches of an animal's hair to fall out. So if a fox gets mange on its tail, it will cause the hair on the tail to fall out, and that will make it look like the fox has a long, thin tail, like a thylacine. However, one way to tell a fox from a thylacine that mites can't affect is their heels. On their hind legs, foxes have heels that are rather high up, while thylacines have heels that are very low, much nearer the ground. So you can tell whether you're looking at a thylacine or a fox with mange by looking at its hind legs and seeing whether it has high heels or low heels. And when you do that with a lot of the videos of proposed phylocenes, it turns out they're actually foxes. Do we have any promising videos? One of the most promising is some footage that was reportedly captured in Australia in 1973 by a couple named Liz and Gary Doyle. The video quality isn't great, given the camera they were using, but it shows an animal running across what looks like a camping area. The size and shape of the body look right for a thylacine. The animal looks like it's the right color, it's got a long, inflexible-looking tail, and when people have done freeze frames, it looks like the animal might have stripes on its hindquarters, so it's hard to tell because of the poor video quality. Some people have said that it looks like it has low heels, like a thylacine, but others have argued that you can't really tell that because of the way it's running. And some have argued that you can see its ears flopping up and down like a dog's. But again, the low video quality makes this debatable. So a lot of people consider this a promising video, but it's not close to being conclusive. As someone who's studied thylacines for a long time, what does cryptozoologist Richard Freeman conclude? He states, If I were a betting man, I'd put good money on the survival of the Tasmanian wolf. I think it's just a matter of time until definitive proof of the creature's continued existence comes to light. It is not without reason that the thylacine has been called the healthiest extinct animal you will ever see. And he may well be right. Have there been any recent scientific assessments of whether the thylacine is still alive? There have, and in 2021, a mammal ecologist named Barry Brook at the University of Tasmania and a team of colleagues published a preprint of a study they had done. The preprint is on bioarchive.org and will have a link to where you can read it for yourself. In the study, they looked at more than 1,200 thylacine sightings from 1910 to 2019. They mapped them and they assigned probabilities and ranked them by credibility. Their conclusion was that thylacines likely survived long after 1936. They produced probability charts showing how likely it was that thylacines were still alive in given years and how likely they were extinct, including projections into the future. To their surprise, Brooke's team concluded, based on the probability-weighted sighting reports, that there was a greater than 50% likelihood that thylacines survived in in the wild until the early 2000s around 2006. But then, the probability of their surviving in the wild drops below 50% and continues declining. Even now, over 15 years later, their charts show between a 10 and 20% chance of thylacines surviving in the wild, and that's a lot better chance than you'd get for most cryptids. Suppose the thylacines are extinct. Do we have a chance of bringing them back through DNA technology? Absolutely. In fact, people are already working on this. Uh, In fact, there have 
been multiple developments just in the last year, in 2022. In February 2022, it was announced that a group known as DNA Zoo had sequenced the genome of the thylacine's closest living relative, the numbat. Thylacines share about 95% of their DNA with numbats, which would make the numbat genome a framework that you could then stitch thylacine DNA into in order to reproduce the animal. Then, in August 2022, the University of Melbourne announced that they had partnered with a Texas-based company, Colossal Biosciences, to actually pull the trigger and de-extinct the thylacine. Colossal Biosciences is also working on de-extincting the woolly mammoth, and at its website, it has a 10-step process for de-extincting the thylacine that it describes. Scientists have already sequenced the thylacine genome, They did an initial version in 2018 of a 108-year-old specimen in the Victoria Museum of Australia. They got an updated version in April of 2022, and they think it will only take a few years until we have a thylacine or at least something that really closely resembles one genetically. According to Professor Andrew Pask of the University of Melbourne's Thylacine Integrated Genetic Restoration Research, or Tiger Lab. The question everyone asks is how long until we see a living thylacine? And I previously believed in 10 years' time we would have an edited cell that we could then consider progressing into making into an animal, Professor Park said. With his partnership, I now believe that in 10 years' time we could have our first living baby thylacine since they were hunted to extinction close to a century ago. So, maybe just 10 years. Things are looking up for thylacines. Even if they are extinct, they may soon not be. Let's talk about thylacines from the faith perspective. Let's start with the question of letting animals go extinct in the first place. How serious is that? Well, in Genesis 1, we read, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That dominion mandate is not simply a mandate to exploit the animal kingdom and do whatever we want with it. Uh, Yes, we can take care of our needs using animals, but it's a mandate to take care of the animal kingdom for God. If a king has dominion over a nation, the king has responsibilities to oversee the welfare of his subjects. And so we have responsibilities as a species to care for the animals of the world. The compendium of the Catechism of the Catholic Church states, The seventh commandment requires respect for the goods of others through the practice of justice and charity, temperance and solidarity. In particular, it requires respect for the integrity of creation by the prudent and moderate use of the mineral, vegetable and animal resources of the universe, with special attention to those species which are in danger of extinction. So we have a special responsibility of care for species that are in danger of extinction. Does that mean we have to never let a species go extinct, that we have to preserve everything? No, because that would be impossible. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church notes, With infinite wisdom and goodness, God freely willed to create a world in a state of journeying towards its ultimate perfection. In God's plan, this process of becoming involves the appearance of certain beings and the disappearance of others. The existence of the more perfect alongside the less perfect, both constructive and destructive forces of nature. With physical good, there exists also physical evil, as long as creation has not reached perfection. One of those physical evils is death, including the death of an entire species or extinction. As long as the world has not reached its final state, this is part of God's plan for creation, and it's been that way for billions of years, with new species coming into existence and older species disappearing. And we humans have directly benefited from this aspect of God's plan. 
if the dinosaurs hadn't gone extinct 60 million years ago and freed up all those ecological niches, we wouldn't be here. In any event, we couldn't freeze time and keep every species alive even if we wanted to. Man does not have complete control of everything that happens on Earth. We can't stop evolution from happening, so there are species that we can't save and keep from extinction, and there are species that we can't keep from developing. All we can do is manage the animals we can affect, and there are costs to doing that, and we don't have unlimited resources. Economics is the study of limited resources with alternative uses, so the question of keeping a species alive is an economic one. That doesn't mean it all boils down to money, because not all economics is money, but it does mean that we have to make judgment calls about the resources that we have and which resources we can afford to devote to keeping a particular species alive. What about the thylacines? It's widely believed that we had a direct role in their going extinct. Do we have moral blame for that? Well, not you and me personally or the listeners. We weren't even born yet. Uh, but it does appear that humans had a negative impact on thylacines, including Aborigines bringing dingoes to Australia in prehistoric times and European farmers and their use of thylacine habitat more recently. I can't pass judgment on those situations because I'm not in a position to do so, and I certainly can't say, oh, humans must never move into a new territory and live there, because that would negatively impact human needs, and we are allowed to use plants and animals to meet human needs, so we shouldn't have an under-all-circumstances-keep-out attitude. But I think it's fair to say, at least based on the research that I've done, that it sounds like European farmers in the 19th and 20th centuries overestimated the threat that thylacines posed to their livestock, and that the bounties that were put on thylacines were a moral mistake to a significant degree. I mean, maybe you need some thylacine control measures, but they weren't the threat that they were thought to be, and I suspect that we didn't need to kill as many of them as we did. Similarly, I think it's fair to say that early efforts towards thylacine conservation were inadequate, though that has to be judged by the knowledge and social conditions at the time regarding conservation, which is something I can't assess. So I think it's arguable that there was a degree of moral responsibility on the part of some humans for the extinction of the thylacines. If that happened, if they are extinct, and even if it didn't, we certainly contributed to them being put in a highly endangered status. If we did help them to go extinct, do we have a responsibility to bring them back? You can't have a responsibility to something that doesn't exist. So, no, in the proper sense, we do not have a responsibility to bring back extinct species, even if we have the ability and resources to do that, because de-extinction has costs and impacts. And so it's an economic question, too, in the broad sense of resource management. However, I do think that on balance, bringing back thylacines would be a good thing. Uh, we had a role in their going extinct, but their habitat still exists, and we could repopulate them and reintroduce them to the wild. What about people who would say that we shouldn't devote the resources to bringing thylacines back, that we should focus on saving other species from extinction? Or spend that money on human needs? You can always say those kinds of things about any project, and in some cases you'd be right. It might be better to spend resources on something else. But it's a mistake to have the idea that just because resources could be used another way, that they should be used another way. Ultimately, this is a judgment call, and I don't see any barrier in principle to bringing thylacines back. Also, it's important not to take a simplistic view of how things work in making decisions like this. While there are always alternative uses for resources that might be better, you have to ask yourself whether you can realistically use them for those other purposes, or otherwise they'll just be wasted. Also, we shouldn't think of economic matters as a zero-sum game in which someone always loses. If we spend resources on the research 
and the researchers needed to help bring thylacines back, then those researchers make a living, and they spend the money they earn and pass that resource on to other people, and the overall economy is boosted. People get jobs, food, and broader human flourishing is encouraged. That's why it's better to give someone a job than just give them a handout. And we learn new things by undertaking efforts like this, just like we learned a whole bunch of new things that benefited society from the Apollo program to visit our sister planet, the moon. Bringing back woolly mammoths and thylacines would teach us bunches of new things that will have practical applications in the future. Of course, you're then going to have Jeff Goldblum from the movie Jurassic Park saying, Yeah, yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. Yes, but we're not talking about bringing back tyrannosaurs or velociraptors. Thylacines are nowhere near as dangerous. They're basically marsupial dogs. What's more, they were the apex predator in the areas where they lived, and currently those areas don't have an apex predator, which means that their ecosystems are currently destabilized, and we can play a role in restabilizing them by reintroducing their former apex predator. On its face, that would be a good thing. Of course, if you're going to bring back thylacines, well, you need to do it safely with proper controls in place, both in the lab and in the environment, but I think those issues can be managed. We will, however, have a link to an article that argues that thylacines shouldn't be brought back, so you can read it in all its rain on the thylacine parade goodness it has. But personally, I'm on Team Thylacine. Whether they're extinct or not, I'd love to see a robust thylacine population back on the scene. Jimmy, what's your bottom line on the thylacine? People have asked me which of the famous cryptids I think is most likely to actually exist, and presently, I think it's the thylacine. I think there's a good chance they still exist, certainly a better chance than many cryptids, and if they are extinct, I'm excited about the fact that we'll likely have them back in just a few years, so go Team Thylacine! So what further resources can we offer the viewers and listeners? We'll have a link to Richard Freeman's book, In Search of Real Monsters, Adventures in Cryptozoology, Volume 2. Also, information on thylacines, uh, links to the Thylacine Research Unit and their YouTube channel, uh, including that video we played a bit from on paw prints. Also, the other group, the Thylacine Awareness Group and their YouTube channel. We'll have a link to the article about the possible last thylacine to survive in captivity that was recently discovered. We'll have an article on Henry Nix's computer study, the um, sound uh, recording we used of uh, purported thylacine audio in the uh, wilderness. Also, that uh, information on a 2021 thylacine sighting report, the 1973 proposed thylacine footage, uh, the paper on extinction of the thylacine on bioarchive.org that suggested they were still alive as late as 2006. Also, a summary of that paper, an article on the Numbat genome sequencing. Also, a University of Melbourne news release about their uh, current genetics efforts. And one from the University of Melbourne's Thylacine Integrated Genomic Restoration Research, or Tiger Lab, um, Colossal Biosciences Thylacine De Extinction Project, the argument against bringing thylacines back, current information about Summerton Man or Carl Charles Webb, as well as links to the Pints with Aquinas YouTube channel and the podcasts The Catholics of Oz and Let's Science. So that's it from us for this time. We'd love to hear what your theories are about the thylacine. You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, visiting the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619-738- Four five one five. That's six one nine seven three eight four five one five. 
And I want to say a special word of thanks to the folks at Oasis Studio 7 for the video and animation work they've done on this episode. Um, they do video and animation work for hire. So if you have a need for uh, that type of work, do give them a call. You can check out a sample of their work by going to my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Jimmy Aiken, where uh, they do the work on the Mysterious World videos. While you're at my channel, I am trying to grow it. We're trying to make it to 40,000 subscribers now. So I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe to the channel. And also be sure to hit the bell notification so that YouTube will actually notify you when you have a new video that you've asked to be notified about. I got it. It's a two step process for some unknown reason. But do please subscribe and hit the bell. I'd really appreciate it. Also, I uh, want to say thanks to Matt Frad of Pints with Aquinas and also Lindsay, Carolyn, and Lino from the Catholics of Oz and Let Science. So be sure to check out Matt Frad's YouTube channel, Pints with Aquinas, and the podcasts, The Catholics of Oz and Let Science. Folks, be sure to follow Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, your favorite podcast app, or at the aforementioned YouTube channel where you should, of course, remember, hit that bell to get notifications. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion on our show notes at mysterious.fm slash 251. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you by Fairvento Law PLLC, now assisting clients with expungements and set-asides of Michigan convictions. To learn more, call 231-202-3321 or go to fearventolaw.com, F-I-O-R-V-E-N-T-O law.com. And by delivercontacts.com, offering contact lenses at low prices, with free delivery, visit DeliverContacts.com. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Mm -hmm.